People have always used objects to adorn themselves in ways that conveyed meaning to them and to their communities. We can see archaeological evidence of this even 30,000 years ago in Europe, when people decorated themselves with things like mammoth ivory beads, sometimes in enormous quantities. There are also hints of hairstyles seen in various figurines from the Upper Paleolithic that suggest our ancestors have always cared about the way they looked. In late Neolithic Europe, we see more sophisticated figurines being made from clay by the artists of the Cucatani Trapilia culture, with their pronounced feminine shapes and striking linear patterns. Whether these figurines represent goddesses or mortal women is debated, but they surely indicate an appreciation of feminine beauty. The Cucutani Trapilia culture was the aesthetic high point of a broader and older artistic tradition of Neolithic Southeast Europe that came to an end around 3000 BC. After about 2000 BC, along with the growth in overall material wealth, more obviously pronounced social hierarchies, and the emergence of social institutions, Europe saw the increasing expression of individual and group identity through clothing, hairstyles, and objects of personal ornamentation. But it's in the artistic tradition of the civilizations of the Aegean that we most clearly see the emergence of ideals of beauty that we well recognize even today. So how was female beauty represented? What jewelry and clothing did they wear? How did women enhance and emphasize their beauty? How were women represented in Minoan and Mycenaean art? And what did beauty mean to the people of Bronze Age Europe? Before I continue with the subject of Bronze Age beauty, I'd like to thank the Swedish beauty tech brand Foreo for partnering with me on this video. And I want to share some suggestions to those of you who are looking for a great gift for their significant other, because Foreo has a wide range of innovative beauty devices for home use, such as the UFO 2. The UFO 2 is a device that provides a spa facial experience from your home, as it features spa technologies such as thermotherapy, cryotherapy, and LED light therapy that diminishes signs of aging and visibly revitalizes skin. The device is app connected, so you can personalize and recreate your own spa treatment from home, covering any skin type and concern, meaning you can't go wrong. And using this device helps skincare products to penetrate the skin deeper below the surface level, leaving your skin more nourished and glowing. As everyone wants nice skin, I can't think of a better gift for someone you love, or of course, for yourself. Thanks again to Forio for partnering with me on this video, and please check the link in the description below. Now let's go back once again to the Bronze Age. I previously made a video about the emergence of the warrior identity in Bronze Age Europe, starting perhaps with the Belbica culture after around 2800 BC. This doesn't mean that there were no people fighting before then, of course there were. It's rather that the concept of a warrior as an identity becomes ever clearer for archaeologists through burial traditions that emphasized weapons like copper daggers, bows and arrows, and related equipment like wrist guards. And in this era, we see the emergence of distinct female identities too, expressed in large part through the objects and clothing that women were buried with. Now, there are issues with interpreting burial goods. When looking at ancient graves, we're not necessarily looking at how people dressed and adorned themselves during life. There could be special clothing, jewellery and other objects that people were buried in and with that they never actually wore in life. And items that they were buried with could also have been gifts to the dead, interred by family members and the wider community. They could also contain objects made specially for the burial. Archaeologists can sometimes detect these when artefacts show no sign of ever being worn or used before they were buried. But with all that in mind, there is evidence of the clothing and jewellery that people wore in Bronze Age Europe. There are wonderfully preserved examples of clothing from oak coffin burials in Nordic Bronze Age Denmark, dating to around 1300 BC, that show similar but distinct clothing styles for men and women. Men wore cloaks and felt hats, and women wore skirts and blouses with hairnets or bonnets and usually women were buried with hair combs and men with weapons, along with other personal items. And there were other gender-differentiated burial traditions in Bronze Age Europe, like the rich graves of the Unatika culture from Central Europe, where elite women could be buried in their tombs with gold, silver and bronze bracelets, necklaces, arm rings and spiral hair rings. This society, dating to between about 2300 to 1600 BC, was ruled by powerful chiefs, 
Perhaps you could call them kings, along with a wealthy aristocracy, and the women amongst them must have been a remarkable sight in life, covered with shining metal jewellery. In later cultures in Central Europe, like the Tumulus culture, dating to about 1600 to 1300 BC, the women were, if anything, even more richly adorned. This archaeological culture gets its name from their practice of interring their elites beneath large burial mounds or tumuli. Like the rest of Bronze Age Europe, this was a warrior society where the aristocratic warrior elites were buried with their bronze swords, daggers and axes that they wore, displayed and used in life while the women were buried with the most beautifully made bronze and gold bracelets, anklets and armbands, stunning necklaces of amber and glass beads, and long metal pins with ornate heads displaying the potent symbol of the spoked wheel that were used in pairs to fasten clothing. And on their clothing they often wore decorative bronze ornaments applied in linear patterns, for example on a skirt, emphasising the shape and breadth of the hips. These beautiful items were displays of the wealth and power of the women who wore them in life and in death. The specific arrangements of the jewellery and clothing also had regional variations, which conveyed information about what specific group that individual women were from. So we see identities related to ethnicity and social class being expressed through clothing and ornamentation, as well as the gender-specific roles that these aristocratic women carried out in their societies. Soon, however, after about 1300 BC, a great cultural change would emerge and spread across much of Europe. This is known today as the Urnfield tradition. Instead of laying out the bodies of the dead in graves or tombs, wearing and carrying the beautiful clothing and ornaments that tell us so much, the dead would come to be cremated, their ash and burnt bone remains placed into large pots or urns and buried in flat cemeteries. Hence the Urnfield culture or the Urnfield tradition. This practice is surely evidence of new religious beliefs about life, death and the afterlife that took hold from this time throughout Central Europe. There were still grave goods, sometimes buried along with the urns, but we don't see the clear relationships between the objects and specific body parts anymore. This period also saw an increase in metal hoards being placed, perhaps as offerings, into the earth and into rivers and other wet places. These hoards could contain weapons often bent and broken beyond repair, bronze ingots and items of jewellery. Again, we can see the beautiful objects that these people created and wore in life, but much of their context is obscured and the meanings are harder to interpret. But from the Bronze Age Aegean, we have evidence from rich burials in spectacular tombs, as well as artistic traditions depicting the human form in figurines, on pottery, metalwork and in beautiful wall paintings. The Neolithic tradition of making small figures of people, animals and objects continued through the Cycladic, Minoan and Mycenaean periods of ancient Greece. There are thousands of them known from the archaeological record. People were buried with figurines, and as they were found in shrines, they were obviously used in ritual activities too, and people kept figurines in their houses. The famous archaeologist Sir Colin Renfrew spent much of his career excavating in the Aegean, and in 2003 he wrote the following about prehistoric Aegean figurines, quote, We do not know, and we shall probably never know, quite why they were made. They may have had ritual functions, or served as toys, or as educational aids, but it is difficult not to imagine that at least one of the intentions of the maker of each was that the work should be well made and indeed be good to look at, end quote. These Mycenaean ones, dating to around 1500 to 1100 BC, were small, about 10 centimetres tall, and were made of terracotta. They are clearly female, but it's not known if they represent goddesses or mortal worshippers. Many wear flattened headdresses, and dresses or cloaks that billow out as they raise their hands, perhaps in worship. It's hard to say if the shapes and the linear decorations on their bodies represent some real-life costume, as mass-produced figures like this are rather low resolution. Other female figurines, however, show more detail in their clothing. Dating to around 1600 BC, the famous Minoan snake goddess figurines were discovered at Knossos in Crete in 1903 by archaeologist Arthur Evans. Despite their name, we don't really know if they were representations of a snake goddess or if they were priestesses in some kind of snake cult. Evans believed the larger was a deity and the smaller was her priestess, but we don't know if that's right. 
For many cultures, snakes were a symbol of death and rebirth due to their regular shedding of their skin. Snakes could also symbolize fertility, and the bared breasts seen on these figures were a Minoan fashion that most obviously related to fertility, but this custom has also been linked to mourning rituals. We will return to the fascinating subject of bared breasts later. The symbolism of these figures then seems to suggest fertility and death, both inextricably linked in many traditions. Perhaps Minoan women found strength in beautiful small figurines like this, helping to protect them in their sacred duties like bearing healthy children. And perhaps the outfits shown on them tell us something about what women wore on Crete at this time. In fact, the beautiful skirts of many layers and colours are also depicted in Minoan wall paintings. Figures on the Saffron Gatherer's fresco from the island of Thera, also known as Santorini, wear brightly coloured skirts and an open bodice as they go about their work. The cultivation of crocus flowers for their saffron was a very important activity in Minoan society. Saffron was a substance especially revered by Minoan women and was employed in the creation of a female social identity. It had medicinal benefits, was used in the dyeing and perfuming industries, and was traded throughout the Mediterranean. Its importance saw saffron and crocus iconography displayed in ritual and symbolic contexts, in fact becoming a distinct symbol of Minoan women and the feminine identity. We can see in the wall paintings that the labour involved in the painstaking harvesting process was celebrated in itself. The precious saffron was used to make beautiful yellow dyes which we can see in the bodices and skirts of these Minoan women, and the colour itself was associated with wealth and power. The evidence from Thera suggests that there was a female dominated dyeing industry on the island. Saffron was also used to scent and colour perfumes that were kept in ceramic flasks and jars, often decorated with crocus and saffron imagery. The substance was also used in religious contexts, with women worshippers or priestesses presenting gifts of saffron and saffron products to goddesses, and even burning saffron incense, sending its vital essence as a burnt offering into the heavens. One of the most common objects associated with female beauty today is perhaps the mirror. And it was no different thousands of years ago in Greece. Hand mirrors were first seen in the Aegean from about 1600 BC. Oval and circular mirrors like this had been common in Egypt ever since the 3rd millennium, and there they were placed in tombs of both women and men. In the Aegean, mirrors appeared in the tombs of men and women too, although at a ratio of about 5 to 1 in favour of the women. There are about 71 known from women's tombs and 15 from men's, as well as some from hordes and at least one was uncovered in a settlement. These implements of beauty were used by a Minoan or Mycenaean woman to view her hairstyle and makeup, whether applied by herself or her servants. The mirrors themselves were beautiful and precious objects, however they were included in all sorts of female graves, from the exceptionally wealthy ones to the more modestly furnished. Therefore, they can be understood partly as the result of many women's special interest in beauty and body ornamentation, regardless of their social rank, and also as a manifestation of individuality. Because they were not found in all graves, perhaps mirrors were buried with those who had a particular interest in beauty. It's also been suggested that during the exposure of the body for lamentation, the presence of a mirror could emphasise the deceased's exceptional physical beauty. The position of the mirrors in graves can also tell us about how they might have been perceived. A few were placed on the pelvis or chest of the deceased, suggesting that they had been the final gifts from mourners as the body was laid out for the burial. However, in most of the undisturbed tombs, mirrors were found to the left side of the body, either at the feet, by the knee or by the shoulder. In some burials, mirrors were placed right in front of the face, again to the left side. So they were given to the dead in the way that they were used in life because right-handed people hold a mirror with their left hand. This trend shows that they must have been personal implements in life, which had to accompany their owners in the afterlife. In some burials, the mirrors were placed so that they would reflect the image of the dead woman's face. Mirrors reflected in eternity their owner's particular love for beauty. However, the ivory or wooden handles featured various sacred symbols, indicating that these objects also held religious importance. In fact, the mirror itself can be seen as a symbol of the sunrise or of the sun disk, and so was related to death and rebirth. 
There is an image on a signet ring discovered in a profoundly Minoan-influenced Mycenaean grave at Pylos, showing a seated female figure holding a mirror. For various reasons, this is believed to be a goddess, but it surely reflects a scene familiar to mortal women of the Bronze Age Aegean, whether domestic or ritual. The most significant displays of the Mycenaean views on female beauty are the large wall paintings from the palaces of Thebes, Pylos, Tyrans and Mycenae. These feature processions of women, which are believed to be priestesses and worshippers, holding gifts to be offered to a god or goddess. There's about 200 years between the creation of those from Thebes and those from Tyrans, and though the style does develop, these paintings express a common aesthetic. The women wear luxurious and colourful clothing, bodices that reveal bare breasts, in combination with a rich Minoan-style skirt with its layers of fabric, or a simpler Mycenaean full-length garment with multicoloured bands. Their dark hair is done in long tresses with accessories like ribbons, and they wear bead necklaces and bracelets. Their colourful clothing contrasts the stark whiteness of their skin, which was a convention in all Mycenaean paintings, in contrast to the red colour of male skin. White skin was clearly a desirable aesthetic quality for elite Mycenaean women, perhaps a consequence of the luxury of living and working in the shade. The women in the processions appear to step with deferential and graceful moves, heading towards the goddess delicately carrying their gifts of flowers, jars, cloth, figurines and jewellery. They also carry pyxides, a kind of container for precious items, often toiletries like cosmetics. All these gifts are associated with female grooming and personal adornment, and clearly these were the appropriate gifts for Mycenaean goddesses. The famous Lady of Mycenae, or the Mycenae, is perhaps the clearest representation of a female figure in all Mycenaean art, embodying the aesthetic ideal of beauty in her time. It's thought that perhaps she represents a goddess receiving the gifts delivered by her priestesses, her enigmatic smile a sign of her satisfaction with the necklace she has just taken. Although whether she's an immortal receiving a gift, or a mortal handing one over, she surely reflects the image of a real Mycenaean elite woman. She is not a young woman in the first flush of her youth, but appears as a mature aristocrat, perhaps already having had children with her powerful husband, wielding her own kind of power as a woman of an important lineage, as the mistress of a formidable household, or perhaps as the priestess of a sanctuary dedicated to a goddess, in command of its servants and lands. There is another representation of female beauty from Mycenae that is perhaps even more famous. The striking female head made of lime plaster, dating to about 1250 BC and found in the cult center of Mycenae, has come to represent Mycenaean Greece for us today almost as much as the mask of Agamemnon or the Dendra Panoply. Her white face is decorated with red dotted rosettes on the forehead, chin and cheeks. Other figures with symbols on the cheeks have been found, so no doubt this was a common practice, although whether this decoration was painted or tattooed onto the skin, we don't know. And maybe this was worn as makeup only by priestesses, or was never seen on real Mycenaean women at all, only on representations of a goddess. Either way, the symbolic meaning is unknown. Could they be solar symbols, and so could she be a dawn goddess, like Eos? Or do they symbolise flowers, meaning she's a goddess related to fertility, like Demeter? Demeter was associated with poppies, and could these perhaps be symbolic poppies? The truth of this face and its decoration remains frustratingly out of reach, but we can at least appreciate its beauty. Through all the forms of expression, the paintings, the figurines, the jewellery, like bracelets and earrings, clothing and so on, an aesthetic female ideal of the Bronze Age Aegean emerges. For the elite women at least, their physical appearance was improved and enhanced by this colourful and luxurious clothing, their elaborate hairstyles, and also by the use of cosmetics. Female tombs from Mycenae included containers still with trace evidence of the powders and perfumed oils once held within. The female figure was depicted with a narrow waist and accentuated breasts, sometimes shown bared to emphasise femininity and fertility. 
Depictions of Mycenaean women are almost always of women in the prime of their life, of childbearing age, not unmarried girls or old women. However, there is one small image of a woman that seems quite different to those we've looked at so far. She appears on the warrior crater from 12th century BC Mycenae, which I've talked about before in many of my videos because of how well it shows the soldiers of the era and their weapons and armour, including their horned helmets. This ceramic bowl was used for mixing wine and water for communal feasting, probably shared by a ruler with his warrior retinue. But there is another, less well-known individual on this vase. Some believe this figure who bids farewell to, or mourns for, the departing soldiers is an old woman. Dressed in a solid, long dark garment, with her head covered, she could be a mother waving off her adult sons. Although to me she could just as well be a wife seeing off her husband. Perhaps she is a wife and a mother and a sister all at once, watching the men leaving and not knowing if any of them will return. Like all the female figures in Mycenaean art, she is not an individual, but she does symbolise an identity that real women held. However, she is certainly a more sombre figure than the colourful, elegant priestesses who represent the idealised, standardised concept of feminine beauty, especially as it related to serving the gods and their society. The woman waving her men off to war is another kind of idealised female figure, and yet it stands out to me as something far more real, more mundane. Rather than a woman enhancing her beauty with a timeless style to better serve her gods, it shows a woman being all too mortal. This is a rare insight into a more realistic scene that would have been quite familiar to the women of the era, and no doubt it was an ever more common occurrence here in the late Bronze Age because soon this world of beauty would fall into darkness. The Mycenaean palaces like Pylos with its incredible wall paintings would be burned to the ground, or would fall to earthquakes and attacks, during the era known as the Late Bronze Age Collapse. Eventually though, centuries later, after the Greek Dark Ages, the finest expressions of beauty the world had ever seen would emerge here in Greece, and these incredible works of art continue to amaze us even today. You know, there were ideals of male beauty in Bronze Age Europe too, linked to the identity of the warrior aristocracy. If that's a subject of interest, then please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that video when it's published. And in the meantime, to find out more about the hairstyles of Bronze Age Europe and what they can tell us about these ancient societies, please watch this video now. Thank you for watching.